Hey guys, Al here. So we wanted to go into more detail about breaking down carbon load and something we often talk about is how important the ratios are to us. So if you're interested in learning more about carbon load and what's actually in it, follow along in this next video and we'll go more in depth into what exactly is in carbon load and what makes us stand out from the competition. Carbon load. We made some adjustments to the mix. Let's let's talk about that. What adjustments have we made? I just like to say that we're we're more on that. Our idea behind this is to make <clears throat> highest quality possible. When you look at grain percentages, we're like half grains in the fall mix. And I've seen other ones out there that are, you know, 70, 75 percent grains. Grains are cheap to grow, cheap to buy. We want to do this. So we're, you know, as if we were going to plant ourselves, which we do, we want the best mix possible. So like what adjustments have we made besides that, Al? Um, yeah, no, I, I think. I mean, I think that's a great point, Jared. I mean, for example, you know, we have oats in our mix. Oats are a, a great crop. They're they're absolutely a great crop. Um, they work as a nice nurse crop in the fall. We've reduced the rate of oats slightly so we can add uh, better quality grains for wintertime hardiness. You know, fall triticale. Triticale is not a uh, cheap crop to grow or to buy as far as grains go, right? But we still wanted fall triticale in there, winter wheat and uh, winter rye or rye grain or cereal rye. It's all the same, just depending on where you're at. And we actually reduced the oats a little bit. So we still have oats working as a cover crop or nurse crop, if you will, to help get the other plants established. Same with our winter peas and buckwheat. You know, those all work very synergistically together to kind of let your other plants get established. Uh, one of the big changes that we made this year uh, was we actually added chicory. And chicory is a, actually a drought. <laughs> we're talking about drought. It's, it's quite a drought resistant plant. But where chicory really shines, um, in my experience from using it in the past, is uh, it really shines that next spring. It sends a re really nice root system down. I've always found that the deer really, really enjoy eating it. Um, and again, it's not a cheap seed uh, to have in there, but I felt like as far as the quality goes, um, it's it's a really good quality seed to have. The deer like it, and it really does a nice job of bouncing out of the ground that following spring. We did slightly, uh, well, we, we kept in, you know, our crimson, we have our fixin', fixation balanza and our frosty bursine clovers, as well as hairy vetch. Those all do fantastic for us, uh, not only in the fall, uh, but also coming out of the ground the following spring. I will say fixation balanza is an incredible, incredible. I mean, the, the root system on that is just a remarkable root system with a ton of end fixation capabilities. Uh, and what we found is how well it does with these other companion crops. You know, fixation balanza, if you, you can, you know, go to ag farms and stuff, guys who are growing it for cows and stuff like that. And they're like, oh man, traditionally it's kind of a difficult crop to establish. But for some reason, when you have it in this synergistic mix, it does so, so well. So I know a lot of the guys who sent us pictures, including myself, took videos and stuff. You see a lot of the white leaf or excuse me, white seed headed clover in, in the in the fall mix when it comes out of the ground in the spring. And, uh, and that is that fixation balanza. Frosty Bursim, I just love it. It just puts on a ton of above and below ground biomass as well. And then of course, Crimson Clover, who doesn't love that? I mean, it's, it's just a beautiful clover with a really nice fibrous root system, as well as a good above ground biomass. You're gonna have your hairy vetch weaving between all of that the following spring, just doing a great job of adding above and below ground biomass as well to the soil profile. Um, like I mentioned, your chicory, your your buckwheat will most likely die off. Your winter peas you might have some come back, and you're certainly going to have your fall triticale, winter wheat, and rye grain. So we're setting the table starting in the early fall. Um, you know, anywhere from end of July to September first, and most of the Midwest is kind of the planting window. In the Southeast, they might get into even October. You're setting this up for for grains, and we haven't even got into the best part as far as feeding soil and feeding deer, um, or at least one of the best parts, which is our brassicas. And because of a lot of guys having high deer densities, we even increased our brassica rate uh, slightly. What, what you're getting for us, you're buying it for like $110 uh, an acre at a uh, distributor, a little bit more online. We intentionally do that to try to incentivize people to go to our, our distributors. But you're literally getting all of the grains, all of these high quality clovers, right? These are like the best clovers we can source. You're getting winter peas, you're getting buckwheat. You're also getting hairy vetch, so another legume. And then you're also going to get almost an acre's worth. We had to obviously go just slightly under an acre, but it's in that acre range of recommendations. And you're getting all of that in the mix as well of radish, 
Winfred Forge Bass, Brassica, Purple Top Turnip, Spark Natural, and uh, Apaja Brassica. So if you're not familiar with those, basically what we're trying to do there is we're trying to take high quality tuber production brassicas that are going to help break up soil compaction, help feed deer late in the year, help feed soil the following spring when they break down, right? Kind of a natural aerator of the soil, if you will, um, as well as the benefits of having them mix with these other grains and such and take advantage of the microbiome or all the good biology underground. Uh, brassicas are known to really do well when they're mixed with other plants in that way, specifically fungal networks when they're in monoculture, they don't do as well. We're adding those with forage quality brassicas. So the brassicas that aren't meant to make some huge tuber, but they're meant to make a lot of forage, right? Developed in the cattle industry for, for browsing or grazing, I should say, um, and then can actually regrow to continue to keep up with some browse pressure. So that's why, you know, we had such good feedback on Man, my carbon load was eight really hard, but man, it came back the next year. Even some of the brassicas came back. You know, a lot of that is the forage brassicas that are coming back. Um, again, feeding the soil and uh, feeding wildlife from the time it's planted all the way through the next spring. So hopefully I hit on that and uh, some of the reasons why we feel this mix and the balance of the mix is so critically important to our mission.